Hello, my name is Peter Wise. I'm a professor at the Amsterdam University Medical Centers and at the Amsterdam University of Applied Sciences. And this lecture will be about nutrients and hormone effects on the genome. You probably know the statement, you are what you eat. And there is actually a science called nutrigenomics that studies dietary constituents that can affect gene expression. So this is a topic, the expression of genes and the influence of diet components on it uh, of this lecture. This lecture is based on chapter 11 from molecular biology of cancer, but I think you need a bit more context to actually understand um, the whole picture out of the molecular biology of the cell. When you study the uh, website of the World Cancer Research Fund, you will see that uh, they will display 10 ways to protect yourself against cancer. And one of the first, or actually the first means is to be at a healthy weight, or in fact, uh, try not to get overweight or obese. This is the, one of the primary causes of uh, cancer and therefore a main threat to health in general. There are several mechanisms mentioned in the book um, and these four mechanisms I will uh, slightly elaborate to you. First, sex hormone metabolism. In obesity, there are a lot of fat cells uh, that contain aromatase. They uh, contain that naturally, and since you have a lot of fat in obesity, there is a lot of the enzyme present, and this uh, enzyme plays an important role in estrogen production. And estrogen in itself causes a uh, threat as continuogenic um, for continuogenic action. The second way is to increase like adipocyte hormone or adipokines. Obesity causes chronic inflammatory response and produces tumor promoting cytokines, which are in fact called adipokines, like IL-6, interleukin-6 and tumor necrosis factor. Also insulin signaling, um, is important since the release of free fatty acids from adipose tissue uh, will chronically increase insulin levels and they might contribute to the tumorogenic effect. And lastly, the gut microbiota may be changed by dietary uh, means, uh, for instance, an increase in gram positive bacteria that might metabolize bile acids to deoxycholic acid, which is uh, causing liver DNA damage and thereby contributing to carcinogenesis. Now, current human development shows an increase in obesity. In the Netherlands, and these are uh, data from 2012, overweight is 50% on the population level as you can see here, the elderly are at about 60%, and uh, recent data show that by 2040, they will be at 70% of the elderly at overweight. This is actually the mean level of overweight in the United States presently. Uh, and this is a major health threat uh, in Dutch society. So the National Preventia Court uh, defined that we should reduce uh, the incidence of overweight uh, to a much lower level. This will be, a, will be a very, very difficult task, but this will also contribute to cancer prevention. Also at the uh, World Cancer Research Fund website, you will find this message that there is strong evidence that being overweight or obese is a cause of 12 different types of cancer. 
And although they might not include all cancers, so the evidence might not be as uh, clear for all cancers, it is in fact saying to us that obesity is affecting all forms of cancer. This is a table um, at the same website which shows the evidence levels of body fat, fatness and weight gain uh, for different specific cancers. And please don't try to learn this by heart, but it shows you that there is quite a lot of evidence in this area. At the same time, it's important to understand that obesity by unhealthy diet and or unhealthy lifestyle is contributing to uh, type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, as well as cancer. So any protective measure against cancer by uh, improving diet will also positively affect other diseases. So in general, even if there's less evidence for a certain uh, nutrient or food component or diet in order to um, prevent cancer, there might still be way enough evidence for other diseases to be prevented. So I think we should see this in the real context. At the website again, uh, first we have a healthy weight being a nutrition related component. And you will see that uh, these 10 ways to protect yourself against cancer are actually nutritional uh, or diet related uh, observations. Uh, the second one is eating more whole grains, vegetables, fruit and beans, which is nutrition related. Limiting consumption of red and processed meat. Physically exercise is actually a another lifestyle component. Limit fast food. Limit consumption of sugar sweetened drinks. Limit alcohol consumption. Breastfeed your baby. Do not use nutritional supplements. And even after the diagnosis of cancer, still there are uh, quite a few nutritional recommendations. So nutrition plays an important role in the prevention of cancer. And the healthy diet is uh, really uh, the way to go. And the, I will stress this because the nutrients we will come back to uh, are really only the mechanism by which a nutritious uh, diet will affect uh, cancer. And although we don't, will not talk about exercise a lot, exercise, so combined with nutrition, is a healthy lifestyle, also reduces cancer risks. And our National uh, Health uh, Institute uh, shows here the health burden and costs by unhealthy nutrition and low physical activity and together with alcohol and uh, smoking they are actually uh, the most important lifestyle factors that we should address and that may benefit uh, in the sense of cancer prevention so um, introduction to food and cancer really is that the role of diet in cancer and cancer prevention should be integrated into lifestyle modifications. So as part of a normal, healthy life. What is important is that nutrition may uh, have direct consequences for health in a positive sense. Uh, but we have to also make a distinction between nutrition and food that uh, affects uh, health as well, but maybe in a slightly different way as the whole uh, nutrition and also the level of nutrients that may have a slightly different effect or even uh, 
completely opposite effects from nutrition uh, on health. And we will see that later during the lecture. The first uh, figure from uh, the uh, chapter actually shows you some basic aspects of uh, nutrition. It supplies energy, it supplies precursors for biosynthetic reactions, it uh, substantiates enzyme function, and it protects against free radicals. And in all these processes, gene expression actually is involved. Now, there are many food sources that provide micro constituents, um, and they are displayed in the table on the right hand side, that have very different, uh, mainly preventative uh, actions in our body. Some main groups of uh, food products are the cruciferous uh, vegetables like broccoli and Brussels sprouts. Um, the solanaceae or nightshade uh, uh, vegetables like tomatoes and potatoes. It's a bit of a strange group. Solanaceae actually related to toxic compounds as well, but tomatoes are mainly known for a, a large contribution of uh, carotenoids uh, like beta carotene and lycopene. Berries are an inter very interesting group uh, of anti uh, providing antioxidants. Allium uh, vegetables like onions and garlic are very interesting. But also chocolate. But I will not go into that into uh, into chocolate. So what studies show is that, um, for instance, for beta carotene that there is a lot of epidemiological uh, evidence and also animal studies that suggest that there is a cancer protective effect, mainly by fruits and vegetables containing beta carotene. Um, in trying to translate this into the effect of beta carotene uh, 25 years ago, or actually 30 years ago, uh, a study called alpha tocopherol beta carotene cancer prevention study, the ATBC trial, was conducted. Um, a very large randomized controlled trial, and they actually found increased lung cancer in smokers when beta carotene supplement was provided. Now, this changed uh, the whole. Um, idea of the role of antioxidants in cancer prevention. And therefore, next slide. Uh, I think the topic is very important that foods are not interchangeable with pills. So food versus pharma. Because this topic is uh, so important, I made a separate extra YouTube clip that you can find on the, with this link. And please, if you look at it, uh, think about what specifically is important when considering beta carotene use and mortality risk. Now, there are components of foods that regulate gene expression, and we have two major groups, the causative factors and the preventative factors. We'll start with the causative factors. They can be uh, distinctly um, um, numbered to these four, the carcinogenic contaminants, the dietary deficiencies, three, obesity, which we already have dealt with, and four, alcohol consumption. First, carcinogenic contaminants. For instance, the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, the PAH, um, they are um, actually in our milieu, in our environment, and they come from fire industry, cigarette smoke, and car exhaust. So you wouldn't actually relate them to food, 
But if you f burn organic material like meat on the barbecue, you actually produce these uh, compounds. Uh, they also in smoked meat, and they also are generated by burning fat from meat on a barbecue. So we generally generate these compounds by producing food, by food preparation. And uh, they also uh, consumed in this way. And they are cancerous uh, carcinogenic compounds. Now in the Netherlands, uh, spinach reheating has been a topic for many, many years. Uh, spinach is a nitrate rich vegetable and bacteria produce nitrite from nitrate. So when bacteria grow on spinach by storing and reheating uh, the spinach, um, the spinach can become dangerous because of the nitrite forming aspect. But recent research has shown that it is safe to use spinach to by quick cooling and storing it less than four, two days in a refrigerator. Um, in this way, nitrite rich vegetables can be uh, safely reheated, consumed several times a week, and they can even be combined with fish, which has been a reason not to consume it um, in the past. Red meat is a, a hot topic uh, lately. The WHO, the World Health Organization, now says red meat may cause intestinal cancer. It's not completely sure, but there is also evidence for lung cancer. 100 gram of red meat on a daily basis increases risk of cancer with 70%. This means that 100 gram per day of red meat and also uh, an equivalent of 50 grams per day of processed meat, which is, for instance, sausages, versus taking no red or processed meat at all, increases the risk from 6% to 7%. Uh, the mechanism by which red meat uh, seems to operate is probably the high level of heme iron, which uh, contributes to nitrosamines forming and the cogenic effects on them. Other examples of carcinogenic compounds are uh, one, cooking meat at high temperatures, two, aflatoxin B, which is a fungal product and can be a contaminant to peanuts, three, food preservatives like sodium nitrite, and four, salmon, which is a fatty fish that accumulates pollutants like dioxin over the years and uh, is a genotoxic contaminant to, to humans. Uh, this dioxin, for instance, is a normal, normally present in our environment. We can try to avoid it, but we really have to live it because uh, it's in the environment, therefore also in everything we eat, including baby food, as, uh, as we studied uh, many years ago. Another means uh, by which uh, a diet can be of affecting uh, cancer risk is by dietary deficiencies. Here's the example of folate. Folate is actually a B vitamin. Uh, when it is deficient, it increases the risk of colorectal cancer. Folate is a coenzyme for nucleotide synthesis and DNA methylation by MTHFR, methylene tetrahydrofolate reductase. And when you have low folate, this will lead to low DNA methylation, which is then a mechanism for cancer risk. Uh, and the other way is that low folate inhibits DTMP, timine monophosphate synthesis, where by which more uracil is being in, in, built into the DNA, which causes DNA damage and increases the risk. So a deficiency of a nutritional compound may actually compute, uh, contribute to cancer risk. 
Then yet another subject. There are many subjects in this lecture. Chronic alcohol consumption. Alcohol is degraded by alcohol dehydrogenase to acetaldehyde. And this compound is bound to DNA to form a DNA adduct. And this causes mutations. Bacteria in the saliva, so in the mouth, can actually be very active uh, in, in this process. And this increases mouth cancer risk. Um, also, acetaldehyde dehydrogenase to, de to degrade acetaldehyde is a single nucleotide polymorphism, which is common in Asians. And those that have the low enzyme activity are actually alcohol intolerant, and they have an increased risk of esophageal cancer. By the way, 3.6% of cancers is due to alcohol consumption. Then we uh, come to the uh, preventative factors, like the constitu constituents of fruits and vegetables. Uh, you probably know Mediterranean diet, which is rich in fruits and vegetables, tomatoes, grapes, and garlic. And this, is real, this diet is related to a lower level of colorectal cancer. How might this work? DNA damage caused by reactive oxygen species and or carcinogens uh, actually may block, may be blocked by several mechanisms. And there are three ways that these mechanisms are being blocked. One, directly by free radical scavengers. Two, the indirectly by regulating gene expression of phase one and phase two metabolizing enzymes. And three, by apoptosis and cell proliferation modulation. And we'll deal with all these three mechanisms uh, in the next slides. First, the free radical scavenging. Uh, free radicals are displayed in the, on the left-hand side by, uh, uh, this is oxygen, two oxygen atoms, and the red dot is actually an unpaired electron. And the unpaired electron makes this uh, compound dangerous because it's very reactive. And what antioxidants actually do is to do, donate an electron from the antioxidant to the reactive oxygen species by which it is neutralized. This inhibits the reactivity of the compound and uh, ceases the chain reactions that is caused by stealing the electron from another compound and then this steals the electron from yet another compound and this steals the electron from yet another compound and this causes a chain reaction. And this chain reaction is now reduced by providing an electron by antioxidant. And this is called chavaging, scavenging, or cleaning up reactive oxygen species. Now, two very good examples of this is vitamin C, which is a water-soluble vitamin, which can be regenerated by vitamin C reductase, and vitamin E, which is a fat-soluble vitamin that can help in uh, e.g. Um, cell membranes. In this picture, I'll just focus on the upper part here, the cell membrane bilayer, which is uh, made of uh, uh, lipids, and uh, vitamin E is actually part of the cell membrane. And when a free radical attacks the uh, cell membrane, uh, it causes uh, cell damage. And if the antioxidant vitamin E is able to donate the electron and scavenge the uh, free radical, then in fact, the uh, cell membrane can be saved. This is true for other actions of free, free radicals as well. The second means is by prevention or uh, is prevention by regulating gene expression. If, for instance, you have uh, fat soluble toxins like pesticides that can be detoxified by a phase 
one and two defense mechanism in the liver, they go through phase one, which is actually a cytochrome P450 enzyme or other enzymes that cause an oxidative reaction and uh, they produce electrophilic products that still may harmful to DNA. So this is gene expression of phase one enzyme. Then a second step, second phase, phase two is needed to uh, be able to conjugate uh, these compounds that are generated by phase one. And this is done by glutathione sulfur transferases. They produce hydrophilic products and these products can actually be, ex be excreted by, for instance, the kidney. So in this way, uh, we have uh, a detoxification by phase one and two defense mechanism, uh, which is based on the stimulation of gene expression of phase one and two metabolizing enzymes. How do nutrients regulate genes? Well, this is a bit complicated and the slide doesn't really look attractive, I know. I'll take you through the slide step by step and then I'll do the whole thing over in, in the next slide, which has a figure. First, we have antioxidants that may directly influence this whole system, as well as carcinogens like peroxide, hydrogen peroxide, and other electrophilic compounds. Both these antioxidants and carcinogens may actually uh, affect the antioxidant response elements in the promoter region of the genes. So the error is a part of the gene of a, in, within the nucleus of a cell. NRF2 is actually a transcription factor which binds to the error region and this induces the gene expression. KF1 is another compound that steals the NRF2 from DNA. In this way, NRF2 is degraded by a proteasome. So it's gone and cannot be active in gene expression. Now KF1 contains cysteines that sense the redox state of the cell. In this way, it can bind electrophils and antioxidants, like I said above, antioxidants and carcinogens can be bound. And in this way, KF1 is inactivated. At least it is inactivated in the sense that it doesn't bind NRF2 anymore. In this way, NRF2 is free to bind to cofactor MEF. And in this way, it can actually bind to ARA and induce gene expression. So antioxidants in this way uh, stimulate gene expression of phase one and phase two uh, metabolizing enzymes. Again, in the picture, here you see the error region of the gene with uh, the gene being able, in theory, to produce phase two detoxifying enzymes. However, if NRF2 is stolen away by KF1, NRF2 is degraded by the proteasome and it's gone. So there's no enzyme uh, produced. However, if KF1 is stealing the, the antioxidants or it binds to the electrophils, it does not bind the NRF2 and therefore the NRF2 is able to bind to MAF and to the ARA region and induces phase two detoxifying enzymes. So carcinogens have this effect, but also antioxidants. So antioxidants are very proactive in generating the phase two detoxifying enzymes. I hope this makes it more clear for you. The third way by which um, the preventative uh, factors can act is apoptosis or cell death. 
and modulation of cell proliferation. Garlic, for instance, uses three systems. The scavenging system of the free radicals, two, the phase one and phase two enzymes, three, apoptosis and proliferation. And there are several compounds in garlic that can contribute in this way. And Ijone actually uh, has an effect on apoptosis by activating cuspases and producing peroxide. And this probably leads to the cell death. Another compound is EGCG, which is a compound of green tea. Uh, this can bind to DNA methyl transferases. And this might have an effect on blocking telomerase activity, which limits the replicative capacity of cells. Replication, therefore, is uh, uh, limiting, in this sense, cell proliferation. Coming back to the 10 ways to protect yourself against cancer. Uh, one of the uh, main compounds are the whole grains, vegetables, fruits and beans. This is actually plant-based food, which is in general, uh, in all studies, very positive for uh, health and for cancer prevention as well. However, if we simply look at dietary fiber, which is a main constituent of all plant foods, the book actually states that there is inconsistent results. And uh, this can be true. There are many different dietary fibers to be identified in very different uh, food components um, eaten by very different people. So it can be very well true that there are different effects to be uh, studied. However, some of the mechanisms that dietary fiber may contribute to a colon, to inhibit colon tumor regenesis is by fiber. And this is, for instance, by dilution and adsorption of carcinogens in intestinal lumen. So when the food matrix is actually going towards stool production in the colon, uh, it may contain the carcinogens, and as long as it is able, the dietary fiber is able to uh, bind the carcinogens so that they cannot interact with the epithelial cells, um, it might protect them. Also, modulation of colonic microbial, microbial metabolic activity is important because these fibers are uh, fermented into short chain fatty acids. And they are actually uh, the energy supply for the epithelial cells in the colon. So um, when the fiber is there, which is a prebiotic, the probiotics, the, the, the microbiome can be more active. They can produce more energy for the epithelial cells and therefore they can also uh, modify biological, biologically the intestinal epithelial cells. However, dietary fibers can also bind minerals by which they, uh, they might have um, not the protective effect that minerals might have had if they were not bound to fibers. Now, fiber fermentation uh, in the large bowel produces short chain fatty acids, as I already mentioned, and this stimulates cell proliferation. Um, but as I mentioned, this is the energy component. So uh, this is stimulating the epithelial cells, but we don't know how bad that actually is for uh, cancer risk. I found, uh, I quickly found two studies that relate dietary fiber to colon cancer. Uh, uh, both studies are to, from 2018. Here's a study that re with a relative risk of 0.74 uh, for uh, uh, colon cancer risk for the highest fiber intake versus the lowest cancer risk. And in the second study, 
for both proximal and distal colon cancers in both cases around 20% uh, risk reduction. This might not say that all sorts of cancer uh, in all amounts taken in by all people will be protected, but in general sense, dietary fiber is in fact protective for colon cancer risk. Then a uh, slightly different uh, topic is the energy metabolism in tumor cells. Cancer cells need glucose. Uh, they display a rather specific form of glycolysis, namely an aerobic glycolysis, which normally doesn't produce lactate because glucose is then transformed in acetyl-CoA, which is going into the Krebs cycle and the oxidative phosphorylation. Um, but in this case, it does produce lactate, and this is called the Warburg effect. Tumor cells may try to affect their microenvironment to affect immune response of, to the tumor. Uh, they might do that by the high level of glycolysis to lower the extracellular glucose, and this reduces also the glucose supply and the glycolysis and function of tumor infiltrating T cells. So in this way, they try to influence the function of the immune system. Resveratrol is a, is a compound, a polyphenol that is in grapes and wine. And this compound is able to in inhibit the Warburg effect. And this might be the mechanism for being a, a tumor suppressor. Hypoxia, quite another phenomenon, is actually able to upregulate the expression of a glycolysis and to downregulate the expression of Krebs cycle and oxidative phosphorylation, and thereby, uh, in a way, contributes to uh, cancer cell function. Here it is displayed in the figure. Uh, on the left hand side, you can see that there are several phenomena like exercise, starvation, hypoxia that reduce uh, the energy uh, level, the ATP level of cells and the body, uh, and increase the AMP. And the AMP, adenosine monophosphate kinase, AMPK, uh, senses this higher level of AMP and uh, stimulates P53 to uh, uh, stimulate cell cycle arrest and to inhibit the glycolysis. This is actually inhibiting the carcinogenic process, while AMPK also via mTOR can uh, uh, limit cell growth. In oncogenic mutations, uh, when there is HIF and 1 alpha, it can actually stimulate the glycolytic enzymes and inhibit the Krebs and oxidative phosphorylation enzymes. So, thereby stimulating the Warburg effect and cancer cell energy metabolism. So, compounds that can affect uh, part of this system uh, can actually contribute or inhibit uh, to uh, cell, cancer cell survival. Um, yet another uh, subject is human genetic variation. Uh, there is a phenomenon called SMP, single nucleotide polymorphism, which is actually a DNA sequence variation that occur when a single nucleotide, an A or T or C or G, in the genome sequence is altered. Each individual has such uh, SMPs, and together they make a unique DNA pattern of a person. And one part, one hundred percent, uh, one point one percent of the genome varies between uh, individuals. Here is a picture of a single nucleotide polymorphism. The homogeneous C, heterogeneous CT, and homogeneous T. 
on the lower panel. So just one size fits all. Uh, in fact, not because uh, we have different genes and therefore uh, uh, dietary constituents might act differently uh, or generate a different response uh, by uh, inducing uh, genes. So therefore, the nutrients that we take in may not always have the same effect in all people. Uh, we already mentioned the MTHFR uh, effect in folate deficiency um, and acetyl transferase is another example. Um, hydrocyclic amines produced by cooking red meat at high temperatures um, may uh, be cancerous and the rapid type of uh, N-acetyl transferase in combination with lots of red meat um, causes in fact a high co colon cancer risk. So it's an extra high risk of those people eating red meat and uh, having the low um, uh, the, the sorry the rapid type of this enzyme gene. Um, then there's tyrosinase uh, inherited deficiency where you do not produce melanin uh, and in fact you are then albino and this causes an increased risk of skin cancers which is a completely different uh, mechanism. Um, and also a uh, fumarole acetoacetate hydrolase deficiency might uh, be have a cancerogen carcinogen production and accumulation as a result. Then yet another topic. As I said, there are many topics in this lecture, um, and this relates directly to the title: uh, nutrients and hormones and a gene expression. In fact, vitamin D is of course a nutrient, but um, as you can see on the right hand side, uh, vitamin D cannot only be uh, derived from dietary sources, but it can be made in our skin partly by sun exposure and is then uh, provided to the liver, which uh, causes a hydroxylation step and another hydroxylation step in the kidney produces the 1.125 uh, dihydroxy vitamin D, which is actually the active form of vitamin D. Um, and this vitamin D uh, in action is actually uh, working as a steroid hormone. Um, and this vitamin D is hemopreventative uh, because it can inhibit growth, induces differentiation and apoptosis. And in the next slides, you can see slightly better how the vitamin 125D, which is the active component, getting into the cell, it's combined with a, uh, it's a likened to the vitamin D receptor, VDR here, and also combined with the RXR, which is in fact the retinol X receptor. And retinol is actually uh, the word for vitamin A. So you have a combination of vitamin D and A complex uh, going directly to the DNA and uh, contributing to transcription of the DNA. Um, this is a direct action of vitamin D in a sense, and um, because vitamin D and vitamin A uh, have direct effects on gene expression, uh, they are also easily toxic. So uh, slightly higher levels of vitamin D and A intake can be toxic because they have such a direct effect on DNA uh, expression. Then uh, lastly, hormones uh, and especially estrogen and cancer. 
hormone related cancers are for instance endometrium cancer ovary prostate testis also thyroid cancer and estrogen uh, is um, uh, shown to be related to initiation of progression of breast cancer so estrogen likely promotes cell proliferation of the breast which causes a high cell division rate uh, with less time for dna repair errors in dna uh, replication uh, occur more somatic mutations are present and this stimulates the process of carcinogenesis obesity in as already mentioned uh, during the postmenopausal period uh, contributes heavily to estrogen synthesis by aromatase in fat cells and thereby causing higher levels of estrogen. Alcohol on the other side, a large amount of alcohol uh, is degenerated, degraded sorry, uh, by alcohol dehydrogenase which is uh, estrogen de degradation competing for so if there is a lot of alcohol to be degraded, uh, less estrogens can be degraded and higher estrogen levels remain uh, with a possible effect. Also exogenous hormone use like oral contraceptives may contribute to the risk by having uh, higher uh, estrogen levels. And on the other side, uh, preventative can be the interruption of menstrual cycle by pregnancy, lactation, and high physical activity. So uh, in this way, specifically for estrogen, there is a uh, very uh, rather strong relationship with cancer risk. Now trying to summarize all these different topics in this uh, lecture, I would like to say that nutrients and gene expression, for this it is important to understand that nutrients, food, diet may prevent, inhibit, delay, or reverse the process of carcinogenesis. Here you see uh, one of the last uh, pages of the book chapter. Uh, which summarizes the main points that you should address uh, in studying the book chapter. Here are some questions for you to practice. By which three main mechanisms can nutrients have preventative effects on carcinogenesis? Two, in which way can vitamin D affect gene expression? Three, in which way can vitamin E defend cell membrane? Four, why is burning meat on the barbecue bad for you? Five, how do antioxidants regulate gene expression on the molecular level? Six, name two mechanisms by which obesity contributes to cause cancer. Thank you very much for your attention and um, I hope this uh, helps you to get to prepare your uh, exam sufficiently. Thank you.